Hello and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on the live stream today. Uh, I believe that you're doing well. Those of you joining us on Zoom as well as on YouTube. And uh, I see some of you guys joining on YouTube as well. And uh, hello and uh, good evening. So um, this is going to be our IFRS masterclass. And uh, we want to look at a couple of the standards that we need to focus on to really position us to pass the examination so that uh, we can position ourselves better generally in the exams. So if there are any questions, you know what to do. You can put it in the chat for me. Uh, if you're on YouTube or for those of you on Zoom, you can raise your hand, I'll bring you up. Or again, put it in the chat for me if you have a lot of noise in your background and you wouldn't want to or you wouldn't want to talk. So welcome to the masterclass today. And uh, in the next probably two or three hours, we want to go through a number of standards and have a couple of discussions. Then we can see what we can do in that case. But before I get excited, uh, let's see. Okay. Right. So before I get excited, I want to take uh, probably some questions quickly if uh, you have any. So if there are any questions you have, uh, something specific relating to the accounting standards uh, that you would want me to talk about or share my thought on, you can uh, put it in the chat for me, those of you watching us on YouTube, or you can put it uh, as well in the chat if you're on Zoom or Maybe raise your hand and I'll bring you up so that uh, I can take your questions. So if there are any specific questions you have, something you would want me to share my thoughts on about the standard or the standards, you can uh, bring it up and then let's take it before I share my screen and we can get excited about our discussion for today. Uh, give me a moment. Let me bring this up. Come on. Okay. Okay. So let me bring my screen up really quick. And let's see what we can do. There you go. My screen will come up in a moment. Okay. So IFRS, accounting standards, we want to uh, share some thoughts briefly and uh, answer questions as well directly on the standards. Now, as you know already, we've discussed this in some of our discussions and also for those of you who are learning directly under my mentorship and rolling our full courses, We've shared thoughts on the structure of the standard. So I want to do that quickly in uh, three minutes, and then we can uh, get into the standards we want to cover this evening. I'm hoping we can do maybe three uh, standards, or it depends, depending on the time we have available and the questions we are going to be solving. So if you are doing financial reporting, you know already that we're going to have questions on standards, and that's going to be 40 marks in the exam hall, minimum 40 marks. And that 40 will come in from two perspective, financial statement preparation, directly for you to prepare the financial statements. And the reason why there will be a standard question is because of the notes to the accounts generally. So all the notes to the accounts are gonna be based on accounting standards. Then we will have uh, some IFRS questions that examiner will throw at us. And that is also 
uh, a direct question. These are going to be specific questions that the examiner will be throwing us at us in the exam hall. So for financial reporting, Dan deal 40 marks minimum relating to the standards that we need to that we need to understand. But then the question we need to ask ourselves is as an FR student, there are a couple of standards that, like I mentioned uh, and I've mentioned before. They are basic, they are core standards that you must know about. In other words, whether you like it or not, something about them will be in the exam hall. And that is going to be the issue relating to IAS 16, property, plant, and equipment. And that is IAS 12, income tax. Basic standard is going to be there in the exam or you cannot run away from it. And as per the structure of the syllabus these days, IFRS uh, 9 financial instruments has become something basic as well that the examiner always want to uh, share some thoughts on that we need must understand. Then IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers. Revenue from contract with customers. So as a basic standard, in the level three, sorry, in financial reporting, we need to understand these basic standards to put ourselves in the position so that we can ultimately, you know, pass the examination generally when it comes to dealing with uh, the financial reporting exams. Now, for those of you doing corporate reporting also, we have mentioned this uh, already as well, that when it comes to the corporate reporting, what is going to be happening is that uh, we're going to be having a minimum of uh, 30 marks directly coming in on the standards that you need to be mindful of or pay attention to. The way the examiner is going to pull that up will be uh, something relating to the consolidated financial statement. And then also some IFRS specific questions that the examiner will throw at us. But if you remember, like we said, when you're in the level three, there are some key standards that are take home standards that you have to be mindful of. IFRS 9, financial instruments. You need to be mindful of it. Then IAS uh, 18, sorry, IAS 19, employee benefit. You have to be mindful of that in that particular case. Then you go to the issue relating to um, IFRS 2, share-based payments. Then on the low-key IFRS 8, operating segments. On the low-key IFRS 8, operating segment, and you need to make sure you understand that very well uh, as well as we you look at the standards that you have to focus on to be able to pass the examination so these are level three exclusive standards that you have to be mindful of level three exclusive standards so between these two that is whether you're in financial reporting or corporate reporting the examiner may bring a written question on consolidated financial statements so rating or comment questions on consolidated financial statements. For that reason, you have to be mindful of the following standards. IFRS 10, IAS 28, IAS 27, and then IFRS 3, business combination. So these are standards related to consolidated financial statements and the examiner can bring theory or rating questions that you have to be mindful on okay that you have to be mindful of so these are going to be our core takeaway uh standards that we need to look out for but like i say always there there are also a number of standards that are going to be fundamental standards that we have to pay attention to and so in my discussion tonight, 
we're going to be practicing questions and solving uh, issues relating to <clears throat> our OG IAS2 inventories. We will spend some time to look at IAS8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors, and then IAS10, events after the reporting period. So my discussion this evening with questions that we're going to be solving will be relating to these fundamental standards that the examiner uh, will require you to know about and will bring questions on that in the exam hall that you have to be mindful of. Remember, there are two things available here. Either the examiner is going to be directly bringing questions on these standards specifically, which he can do because he has done before, or you're going to use the principles under these standards to be able to answer some questions generally at the end of the day. So let's get excited about it. IAS2 inventories. If there are any questions, you raise your hand, we'll bring you up for those of you joining us on Zoom, or you can put it in the chat for me as well. Then for those of you watching us on YouTube, you can put any questions you have in the chat for me and I'll be excited to answer you as well. Note that my presentation is gonna be coming from uh, my account, uh, corporate reporting and financial reporting book. And the questions we're gonna be solving will also be coming from our question kits. Uh, for those of you who have enrolled in our full course in financial reporting and corporate reporting, you have access to your question kit. So uh, the question we're going to be looking at mainly will be coming in from the question kit as well as from the book. Those of you who have my corporate reporting or financial reporting book. So the discussions are going to be centered in those areas so that you'll be mindful of that and know about it. So the first thing we get ourselves into, like I said, is IAS2 inventories. Now, before I get excited about that, take notes that when it comes to the accounting standards, there are a number of things that you have to be mindful of in order to increase your chances of understanding the standards very well. The first thing is the objective of the standard. Why The objective of the standard tells us why, what the standard seeks to uh, accomplish or do generally in that particular case. Then there are a couple of standards that will have what we call the recognition criteria. This does not come in all standards, but there are a couple of standards that have the recognition criteria. For instance, IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, contingent assets has this. IAS 20. 16, property, plant, and equipment has this. IAS um, 20 has this. IAS 38 has uh, the issue about the recognition criteria that we have to be mindful of. IAS 40, investment property has this. IFRS 15 has this issue. IFRS 16 also uh, has the issue relating to the recognition criteria. So there are a couple of the standards that have these things about recognition criteria, and that is the starting point. Once you know the objective of the standard, why the standard was developed, what the standard is seeking to achieve generally, then it is important you understand also the recognition criteria. Aside that, there are some basic definitions that you must be aware of in the standards as well that we could be thrown at or that we can uh, be asked about. So there are some key definitions that you must know about. For instance, if you're dealing with IAS 16, then there are some definitions like depreciation, amortization, revaluation uh, that you must know about impairment that you have to also know about. So there are some key definitions that you must know about. Then we go to the next one called initial measurement and subsequent measurement. Very important. Initial measurement and subsequent measurement. So there are standards that we must understand. How do we initially measure the item? And after the initial measurement, 
What is the subsequent treatment of that item? So you have to be able to understand because it depends on the context of the question. Sometimes the examiner will ask you the question and it's about the initial measurement or the initial recognition. Other times it's about the subsequent measurement or subsequent treatment of the standard. So you need to be mindful of how the deal is done or how the treatment is done when it comes to initial measurement and initial recognition and how the treatment is done when it comes to the subsequent measurement because that is going to be basic and very crucial for us. Then there are a couple of standards, almost all the standards talks about disclosure requirements. So you need to be mindful of that as well, disclosure requirements, because sometimes the examiner will ask you that, oh, okay, in relation to this item, what are the things that the entity is supposed to disclose in the notes to the financial statement? Uh, well, some of the standards that really highlight issue about disclosure requirements will be IAS 24. Um, that is the issue relating to uh, related party transaction. IAS 21, effects of changes in exchange rates. These standards, the examiner categorically uh, will ask you specifically about their disclosure requirements. Then certainly IFRS 9, financial instruments, and also issues relating to IFRS 15, revenue from, sorry, IFRS 16 rather, leases at the end of the day. So there are some standards. That doesn't mean the other standards doesn't, don't have uh, Record, uh, disclosure requirements, but the examiner may specifically ask you about the disclosure of what should be disclosed in the notes on related party transactions, IAS 24, on effects of changes in exchange rate, IAS 21, or about financial instruments that a company has issued or has bought what should we disclose about it as well? Or leases, how should the entity disclose in the notes to the financial statement relating to the lease? And that is also something that we need to be mindful of that the examiner can ask us in that particular case. So these are the things you need to be mindful of. Then once we arm ourselves with these, we can now jump into what inventories are. Now, remember, this is a basic standard. We're going to explain the principle shortly. Then we take some questions because that is where it becomes uh, really interesting. Yeah, because the principle about our inventories is not a miracle. It's very simple, but it's a, the treatment that becomes a little bit problematic. So you want to stay with me carefully as we solve. There are two questions we're going to be solving relating to the inventories, and you're going to see how the questions technically play out to assist us to be able to understand this standard pretty well. So in a simple language, the objective of the standard is simply to, uh, you know, provide us or prescribe the accounting treatment of inventories, period. Accounting treatment of inventories because it's inventories. Now, there are various types of inventories that you must know about. We have inventories of finished goods, we have inventories that are still not done yet, like work in progress. We have inventories of raw materials that we must also know about in that particular case. You have to know that non-current assets that an entity is holding for sale also can be treated as the inventory of the company. So for instance, if you're a good student of the standards, maybe some of you are not, um, if you're a good student of the standard, there is a standard called IFRS 5, non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation. Now, we, in relation to this standard, what happens is that once it meets the criteria, then the asset becomes an inventory because the entity would want to sell it in the ordinary course of operation. So after the initial recognition on subsequent measurements, the non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation will now be accounted for in accordance with the rules enshrined or stated in IAS2 inventories. So sometimes we, the company can be holding on assets, but these assets will be used to, uh, will be accounted for just in line with IAS2 inventories, inventories. But this is where it gets exciting. So let's look at it generally. What are some of the initial costs? So what constitutes the initial cost of an inventory? 
And so that is where we get into what we call initial measurement. Initial measurement. What constitutes the initial cost of an inventory? Stay with me carefully here. According to IAS2, the initial cost of inventory shall include three things in general. The cost of purchases, the cost of convention, conversion, sorry, and other direct costs. Now, this is a typically if we are dealing with a manufacturing company. So if you are dealing with a manufacturing company, then what is going to be happening is that the inventory cost will have these three components. That is the purchases price, how much we spend to actually uh, acquire the raw materials, any import duties we pay will be brought in, then any delivering costs that we pay will also be brought in to arrive at the initial cost of the assets, uh, at the initial cost of the inventories. But then we are dealing with a factory or a manufacturing company. So the purchases of the inventory alone is not enough. So there could be other conversion costs that we must understand. In other words, the cost of production. Okay, so the cost the entity will incur in converting the raw material into the finished goods will also be included in the initial cost of the inventory. And that is the cost of conversion. And so that could be direct material costs, direct labor costs, and other subcontractor or subcontracted cost. I want you to stay with me carefully with these explanations because as we begin to solve the questions, you will see these directly in the questions. So you have to be mindful of this. So if the entity is going to convert the raw material into finished goods, then what should constitute the cost of the finished goods? That will be the material cost, the labor cost, any subcontract cost that we incur, or other fixed and variable overheads that could also be incurred by the company. Then there are other costs that we will incur generally in uh, bringing the assets or looking at the inventory. So in accordance with IAS 23, borrowing costs, we will look at it later on. If the entity borrows money to manufacture the inventories, then the interest expenses that we pay will be included in the initial cost of the inventory. Don't worry too much about that because when we get to IAS 23, later on, I'm going to explain that to you as well. But note that when an entity borrows fund to manufacture inventories that they will sell, to construct an inventory that they will sell, the interest expense that they incur on the funds that they have borrowed to manufacture the inventories will be included in the initial cost of the inventory. And you have to be careful about that because you can see that even though I'm teaching you inventories, I have brought in IFRS 5 because there is a connection. I have brought in IAS 23 because there is a connection. So you must understand these connections as we build up because as we begin to solve the question, some of these things will pop up in our discussion. So that is the general purchases uh, cost or how we determine the initial cost of inventories generally, generally. So what is gonna be happening generally is that we need to look at the initial cost of the inventory. And if it is a manufacturing company, then certainly direct material cost will come in. And for those of you who have done management accounting or are doing management accounting, you'll be familiar with this. Direct labor costs will come in. And then any direct expenses will be coming in. That will give you prime cost. You know that already. Then you're going to be adding some factory overheads. If there is any factory overheads, we incur. And that will give us the production cost. Because remember, according to IAS2, inventory must be valued at full factory cost. You know this already if you're a management accounting student. According to IAS2, inventory must be valued at full factory cost. Inventory must be valued at full factory cost. For those of you doing management accounting or you have done management accounting, you know this principle because it is in line with IAS 2. 
but you know, sometimes after we initially measure the assets and get the initial measurements like this, we need to look at the subsequent measurement of the inventory. And this is where the journey gets interesting. So subsequent measurements. If there are any questions, if you're on Zoom, you raise your hand, I bring you up, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, for those of you joining us, joining us on YouTube, you can put it in the chat for me, and I'm going to be answering your questions for you uh, as well. So on the subsequent measurement, inventory should be valued at lower of cost and the net realizable value. I want you to stay with me very carefully here. So on subsequent measurement, we value inventories at lower of cost and net realizable value. Remember, the cost part, we've already spoken about it here. But the net realizable value simply means if we should sell the inventory today, how much are we going to get? If the entity decides to sell the inventory today, how much are we going to get? That is the idea about net realizable value. That is the idea about net realizable value. So we say that if you bring in the selling price, let's say we're working in dollars. If you bring in the selling price, you less um, cost of any repairs or damages. That is if the inventory is faulty and we have to repair it, or if we have to convert raw material to finished goods, then we are going to bring in cost of production. Then we're going to also less cost of sales. Now, when we say cost to, cost to sell here, it means any other cost we incur to sell the inventory. Probably we need to pay some agent commission or an agent for the arrangement of the sales transaction, and that must be less. When we subtract that, that gives us the net realizable value. Please stay with me carefully here because the principles we are establishing here, like I said, I'm going to use them to solve a question in a moment. So we are saying that you can determine the net realizable value of a finished goods. Of a finished goods. You can determine net realizable value of finished goods. When you are determining the net realizable value of finished goods, usually it is going to be the selling price less maybe the finished goods is damaged, any repair cost you have to pay, less any cost you, you will incur to sell it, then you will get a net realizable value. But sometimes we can also determine the net realizable value of raw materials. That is, if the entity decides to convert the raw materials into finished goods, then what will be the net realizable value? So that we can compare the net realizable value when we convert the raw material into finished goods with its original cost, and the one that is lower becomes the amount at which the inventory will be, carried, will be carried, will become the amount at which the inventory will be carried in our books. So on subsequent measurements, what are we saying? We are saying that inventory will be carried at lower of cost and net realizable value. Inventory will be carried at lower of cost and net realizable value. Then we have to note that when you are determining the cost of inventory, there are a couple of things that should not be included. You have to be careful because the examiner can trap you and include some of these items in the question. And if you don't know about it, it is going to influence the value that you place on the closing inventory of the company. So note that inventory cost should not include any abnormal waste. Normal loss is acceptable, but abnormal cost or abnormal waste should not be included. Storage cost is not part of inventory. So it is not going to be 
included. Administrative overheads that are not related to production will not be included. Selling costs will not be included as well in that particular case, in that particular case. So these items are not going to be included when it comes to dealing with the cost of inventories, when it comes to dealing with the cost of inventories. So that is generally what we must understand about the accounting treatment of inventories. Then technically there are some disclosure requirements that we need to look out for that in the books of the company or as part of the notes to the financial statements, the following items must be disclosed in the notes. What accounting policies we are adopting for the inventories? Very important. Okay, are we carrying inventories at the net realizable value or we are carrying inventories at cost? It has to be categorically stated in the question. Not only that, how are we carrying all the various types of inventories in our books? We have to disclose it. If there is any impairment in inventories, because remember, let me say this to you very carefully. If an inventory, when, when it happens is that when the cost of the asset, cost of inventory is greater than, stay with me carefully, the net realizable value of the inventory, this means the inventory has suffered impairment and must be written down. That's an impairment loss. It means that the inventory must be written down. So that is what you need to understand. It means the inventory must be written down. So for instance, in our books, we are carrying the inventory at $10,000 but we check it and the net realizable value of the inventory is $8,200. We said that inventory should be carried at lower of cost and net realizable value. So for that reason, we will carry the inventory at $8,200. But remember, in our books, it is $10,000. So that $1,800 becomes the impairment of the inventory and that must be written off and recognized in the PNL accounts. To be recognized in the profit or loss accounts. To be recognized in the profit or loss accounts. So that is very crucial when it comes to dealing with the accounting treatment as well as the disclosure. So we have to disclose if there is any amount of inventory that we have written off, any inventory has suffered an impairment during the year, that has to be disclosed categorically in the uh, treatment for the period under review. Can we go over the impairment? What we are saying here is that when the cost of the inventory is greater than the net realizable value, it means there is an impairment in inventory. Like I illustrated here, if the company is carrying the inventory at $10,000 in their books, that is the cost of the inventory. But when we look at the net realizable value, the net realizable value of the inventory is 8,200. If you remember earlier, we said on the subsequent measurement, inventory should be carried at lower of cost and net realizable value. So even though the cost is 10,000, the net realizable value is 8,200. For that reason, we have to carry the inventory at the 8,200. So when you carry the inventory at the 8,200, that means it is below the cost which is in your books. So the difference becomes impairment and that must be written off in the PNL accounts because the double entry for that is your debit profit or loss, with, for instance, our illustration, 1,800, then you credit inventory as well with a 1,800 technically. That is what we mean by writing down or doing impairments. Now the flip side is not true. 
If it happens that your net realizable value is greater than the cost of the inventory, we still carry the inventory at cost. It's not revaluation surplus. It's not a revaluation surplus. So where the net realizable value is greater than the cost of the inventory, the inventory is still carried at its cost. The inventory is carried at its cost. So that is the idea basically about when you talk about the issue relating to the impairment. So when the cost is greater than net realizable value, it has suffered impairment. But when the net realizable value is greater than the cost, we carry the inventory still at its original cost and it is not a revaluation for the period under review. So that is the issue also about that. Then any other carrying amount of inventories pledge as securities for liabilities. Now, I want you to understand this a little bit well, but uh, later on under IFRS 9, financial instruments, I will explain this to you, but let me just share with you some principle about that for you to understand. You see, when an entity sell, sell goods with a repurchase option, okay? So sale of goods with repurchase option. This is a financial instrument. Because the reason is that with this transaction, it is not a sale. It is not a sale because we have an option to buy it back. So if it is not a sale, what is it? It is a financial arrangement and the inventory is being used as a collateral facility. Okay. And inventory is being used. Is used as collateral facility. What does that mean? It means you don't recognize sales, but the inventory will still be recognized in our books. Okay, so the inventory will be part of our closing stock. Then now the amount we receive from the proceeds will be accounted for in accordance with IFRS 9 financial liability because that is a financial liability. Now, what we are saying here is that as part of the disclosure requirement in your notes, if you have any arrangement like that, where we have sold goods, but the entity has an option to buy it back, then we have to disclose in the notes so that the users of financial statement will understand that, by the way, uh, part of our closing stock, it's say $40,000, but that is technically ours, but not ours because we have used it as a collateral facility. So it is to enhance faithful representation of the financial statements. So if there is any inventory involved in such transaction, sale of goods with repurchase option, because it is not a sale and we still have to account for the inventory in our books as though it is ours, IAS2 requires that you make a disclosure in the notes about that goods in question, which you have used as a collateral facility in order for you to obtain loan from the lender, to obtain loan from the lender. So that is the issue also about that kind of arrangement or that kind of scenario. If there are any questions, you raise your hand, we'll bring you up or you put it in the chat. For those of you joining us on YouTube, I see some of you guys joining, you are welcome. Uh, we are looking at IAS2 inventories. If there are any questions you have, put it in the chat for me. I'm going to be replying. And then give us a thumbs up on the video. For those of you watching on YouTube, it helps us a lot to push the video to reach others as well. So that is another disclosure requirements that we need to make. Then cost of inventories recognized as expenses. And that is that will be part of uh, cost of sales. We have to make disclosure requirements also on that. So you realize that I am explaining IAS2, but you saw that we've brought in financial instruments. We've brought in non-current asset held for sale. We've brought in borrowing costs, IAS23. 
And you must know when they all come in to assist us in dealing with the standards. So that is why I keep on telling you that the standards are not in isolation. Okay, they are not just on their own as you could see them independently on their own. They are actually connected with each other. But technically, that is the idea about what we must understand when it comes to dealing with inventories. When it comes to dealing with inventories. Right. Now, so with this knowledge on how we measure inventory and subsequently account for inventory, let's crunch some numbers. And we're going to be looking at two questions. Let's first look at the, simpl the simpler one. This is more simple. So let's look at it first. Then we'll take the more, you know, quote unquote complex one in our question kit. So this question for those of you with our book, the financial reporting or the copy reporting book, this question is there. If you don't have it, you can take a screenshot because it's available on your screen. So let's see the requirements here. It says, what figure for closing inventory would be shown in the statement of financial position? What figure for closing inventory would be shown in the statement of financial position? Okay, so let's see what we got. Neil paid $3 per unit for raw materials of its products. So inventory cost or raw material cost is $3. Now remember, the examiner is asking us about a closing stock. And you know that we said closing stock should be lower of cost and net realizable value. Lower of cost and net realizable value. To complete each unit, to complete each unit incurred $2 per unit in direct labor, production overheads for the year based on production output of 12,000 units was $72,000. So the first information above here, it's about the manufacturing cost, if you want to. All right, the manufacturing cost, if you want to. So that is giving us about the manufacturing cost, the cost the entity in care in the manufacturing of its product, the manufacturing cost. So we can get excited to calculate what the manufacturing cost even is of the inventory. Then we get it, we continue with our reading. So let's go here. Neil, slash in our currency sign. And let's see what we have. Okay, I'm I can I'm not supposed to move, I can be here. So raw material cost is three dollars. Three dollars. Then labor cost we are told is two dollars in the question. Labor cost is two dollars in the question. Stay with me carefully. Then he says production overheads for the year based on normal output of 72,000 units was seven based on one 12,000 units was $72,000. So that would be factory overheads. Remember we said in determining the initial cost, we bring in the raw material cost, the labor cost and factory overheads. Remember the principle we established in the beginning. And so that is going to be $72,000 divided by 12,000 units. So we divide that up to see the answer that we get, and that is going to be $6. So we add that up, and that is the production cost per unit. 
So it means that if we want to determine the cost of inventory of the company, it is going to be $9, $11 per unit. So inventory will be valued in cost at $11 per unit. Inventory of finished goods will be valued at $11 per unit. Then let's go to the second paragraph. Due to industrial action, only 10,000 units were produced and 1,000 were in inventory at the end of the year. Stay with me carefully. They produced 10,000 and 1,000 is in inventory. Okay, so it means that the closing inventory we are trying to value here is the 1,000 units. Okay, so the closing inventory we are trying to value here is 1,000 units. They produced 10,000 and 1,000 were still in inventory at the end of the year. So our closing inventory is 1,000 units. That's our focus. So why did the examiner give you 10,000? Yeah, he's telling you a story. You follow the story. It's a result of industrial or the industrial action some units were badly stored and became damaged. Okay. Remember I told you that in determining the net realizable value, remember we said it here, in determining the re net realizable value of inventories, what happens is that we are going to bring in our selling price, then we're going to less cost of repair. Or if an inventory is damaged, the cost to restore it so we can sell it. So the examiner is telling you here that some of the inventories were badly stored and became damaged. The final sentence. It is estimated that 200 of the units will now only be sold for $12 each after a minor repair or after minor repairs of $2 each. So remember, we have 1,000 units. 200 of that, the examiner is saying that can be sold for $12 after a minor repair. So selling price for this is $12. Then we must do a minor repair, MR, of $3. What does that mean? It means the 800 is not having any problem. So then the 800 must be valued at the full factory cost. Hmm? The, the 800 must be valued at the full factory cost. But we need to determine the net realizable value of the damaged inventory and compare it with the full factory cost and what is lower will be the decision rule for us to make in this particular case. To make in this particular case. So let's take it one after the other. Let's look at the net realizable value for the damaged goods. So net realizable value. So when it comes to the net realizable value, we would have to look at the issue, minor repairs, $2, okay? We're gonna bring in the selling price. So we are told the selling price is $12 in the question as stated. So our selling price is $12. So we bring that up. Then we are told that the repair cost is $2 per unit. So we're going to less that repair cost. $2. So you less that. So we don't have cost to sell here. So it means our net realizable value is going to be $10. Stay with me carefully. If you compare the net realizable value to the factory cost we calculated earlier, the factory cost was $11. So we carry inventories at lower of cost and net realizable value. So it means the damage inventory of 800 will be carried at the net realizable value of what? 10. So in that case, 
what will be the value of our closing inventory? Our closing inventory will then be equal to the undamaged inventory which is the 800 units that will be valued at a full factory cost of what 11 because we were not giving selling price for the inventories that are not having problem then the damaged inventories which we you know repaired which is the 200 units will be valued at the net realizable value of 10. So 200 by 10, that is 2,000. Then 800 by 11, that is 8,800. So in total, the closing stock of inventory will be 10,800. That becomes the current amount of inventory on the face of the statement of financial position. That will be the closing inventory on the face of the statement of financial position. So that is how we will value this inventory in the context of this particular question. That is the issue here. And that's how we answer this question. Like I said, this one is very simple. We are just, you know, testing the waters with it. We are just looking at it in a very, you know, relaxed manner. It doesn't have a lot of stories to tell. You just have to think closely about the fact that the selling price given relates to the damaged goods and that the 800 remaining will be valued using the uh, factory cost using the factory cost. And that is the answer to this particular question relating to Neil. If there are any questions, for those of you on Zoom, you raise your hand, we bring you up, or you can put it in the chat uh, for us in that particular case. Then um, for those of you on Zoom, uh, YouTube, you can also put your questions in the chat uh, for me there. Samuel Edwin Nelson said, good evening. I'm glad to be here. Okay, Samuel, thanks for joining us. Michael Quartin said, good evening, Nishira. Good evening, Michael. Mr. Clement Damwa Ababio said, following from Winneba. Thank you, Clement, for joining us. Samuel Wuchery said, this man is wow. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Caleb Odini, what's that? Odini Yi said, thank you, Nishira, for coming to the rescue of many accounting students. Prosperity. What posterity will remember you for this? Okay, thank you very much, Caleb. Salome, thank you for the good work you are doing, sir. Thanks for joining us, Salome. I hope I got that name right. Okay, so that is the idea about inventory in that particular case. <laughs> Morrison in the chat said, Inshira the darling boy, I love you, bro. <laughs> Thank you, Morrison. <laughs> okay, so that is the very simple question. But now I want you to arm yourself. I mean, put on your seat belt because I want to take you on a journey to another question that will rock your brain. You ready? Let's go. So you go to your question kit on page 62. Those of you who have enrolled in my full course, in our full course on, on online or studying under my mentorship, you have your question kit with you, whether FR or CR, page 62, there is a question there, Saboba Limited. Saboba Limited. And uh, we want to look at that question. If you don't have the question kit, you can take a screenshot as, you know, the question is on the screen already. But those of you with the question kits, you can go to your question kit, page 62, inventory is the very first question. We want to crunch some numbers there because, I mean, this one is more interesting than what we just did in that particular case. And you will love it. You will love it. It's a five mark question. Jeez, how can the examiner do that? This lot story like that five marks. But hey, there we go. Like I said, I want you to stay with me very carefully here because it's going to get a little bit interesting here. 
I can guarantee you it's going to be really, really interesting here. So stay with me very carefully here. I don't want you to mix it. What is the requirement here? It says that calculate the value of closing inventory in the books of Saboba Limited at 31st May 2018, applying the principles of IAH2 inventories. Applying the principles of IAS2 inventories. Okay, let's see what we got. Please follow me carefully and don't get lost, okay? Saboba Limited, Saboba, manufactures plastic water tanks for the farming industry. So remember, the plastic water tank is the product they manufacture. Okay, the plastic water tank is the product they manufacture as a company. Is the product they manufacture as a company. On 31st May 2018, its closing inventories, on 31st May 2018, its closing inventories Just giving me some feedback in my slide like that. So the entity had closing inventory of finished goods. That is plastic tanks. Okay, sorry, let me take that again. Its closing inventory consisted of 950 kilogram of plastic resin raw materials and 250 finished units of the plastic tank. Further information is provided below. So two things here. So when it comes to raw material, they have 950 kilograms. So inventory, raw material, which is the plastic resin. They have 950 kilograms. We have to value that. We have to value that. Then they have a finished goods or some finished goods as well. And the finished goods are 250 units. The finished goods, 250 units. Please stay with me carefully here. The way you value them will be different, okay? Now, when it comes to the finished goods, we, will, we are going to value the finished goods using the principle you know already, lower of cost and net realizable value. So with the finished goods, no P, we'll value it at lower of cost and net realizable value. But when it comes to the raw material, its valuation will be a little bit different. So stay with me carefully. We're going to read the story together and build the knowledge together. Okay? We will read the story together and build the knowledge together. So let's go. Number one. Plastic, which is the raw material. The purchase price of plastic resin was three Ghana CD per kilogram throughout the year to May 31st, 2018. Plus additional $0.5 per kilogram of delivery cost. Of delivery cost. So material, if we want the raw material, it is going to be three Ghana cities per kilogram. But there is a delivery cost of $0.5 per kilogram that we pay. Stay with me carefully. Saboba has a policy of always keeping plenty of plastic resin in inventory and its supply can be unreliable. Sorry, as its supply can be unreliable. However, close to the year end, the price of plastic resin reduced due, due to supply exceeding demand. The purchase price of Saboba's raw material is now 2.1 zero Ghana cities per kilogram plus the 0 0.5 Ghana CD per delivery charge. Per delivery charge. 
the existing inventory of plastic resin can be sold in the market for 1.8 Ghana CD net of all costs. Ooh. Ooh. So it's getting a little bit interesting with a lot of stories that the examiner is trying to tell us, but we need to make sense of the stories that the examiner is telling us. So this is the raw material information. So when it comes to the raw material, what do we do? So let's try to place some value on the raw material. Let's try to place some value on the raw material. I think we're in Ghana City, so the miserable currency, how you go do them? It's our currency anyway. And so let's calculate the cost per unit of the raw material for the entity. Cost per unit of the raw material for the entity. Go back. What do we have? Purchases. We are told the company pays three Ghana cities to buy the inventories. So purchases cost is three Ghana cities. But remember, in our explanation, we said inventory should be carried at what? Sorry, the initial cost of inventory shall be purchases cost plus all other costs incurred in bringing the inventory to its present use. For that reason, the delivery cost of the raw material would have to also be considered. And so what is the delivery cost of raw material? 0.5. The delivery cost of raw material is 0 0.5. So we bring that up. What does that mean? It means that the total cost of material it's going to be 3.5 Ghana cities. 3.5 Ghana city. So that is the cost of raw material. That is the cost of raw material, 3.5. Let's go back to the story. The examiner is saying that now the purchases price of Saboba's raw material is 2.1. We don't care about what the purchases price now is. Please stay with me carefully. Stay with me very carefully. Why? Because the information that is provided here as 2.1 is called the replacement cost. So if today the entity want to buy the inventories, the replacement cost will be 2.1 per kilogram. But this is an inventory the company uses to manufacture products. So we cannot value it using the replacement cost. If it is inventory that they use in the office, like office tables and papers, then we could use the replacement cost. But in the context of this question, we would have to value the inventory at the historical cost, which is the 3.5 per kilogram. So this 3.5 per kilogram is technically a historical cost. That is the initial cost we incurred to acquire the inventory. We will not use the replacement cost, the current cost of buying the inventory. Okay. If there are any questions, you raise your hand. We we'll bring you up for those of you on Zoom or you put it in the chat for us. Uh, for those of you who are also on YouTube or as, as well as on Zoom. Let's continue. The existing inventory of plastic resin can be sold in the market for $1.8 per kilogram net. Oh, so right now, the inventory that they have, which has a historical cost of $3.5, has a net realizable value. So net realizable value. will be the expected sales proceeds. So net realizable value will be the, our expected sales proceeds if we sell the inventory. 
And that is an amount of 1.8. Stay with me carefully. So assuming this is the only information we had, again, stay with me carefully. Assuming this is the only information we had, then the raw material will be valued at the lower of these two. Then it would have been valued at what? The 1.8. Sounds good? Assuming this was the only information we had, then the inventory will be valued at the 1.8. Why? Because inventory shall be valued at lower of cost and net realizable value. But you have to continue to read the question because it's together. So there could be some information that we have to be mindful of. So let's go to the second scenario. So that is the breakdown of the scenario number one or of the I scenario. You are not done. You cannot value the inventory now. You need to continue to read it because since it's a raw material, it can be converted into finished goods. So you have to build up your knowledge on that very well as well. So II, tanks, that is the finished product. Tanks, that is the finished product. Each tank required 10 kilogram of plastics to manufacture and each unit incur $25 in conversion cost, that is labor cost and overhead. Ooh, ooh. So that is labor cost and overhead. Saboba sells the tanks for 100 Ghana cities. It is expected that the price will drop to 90 Ghana cities because of the fall in the market price of plastic. All completed units sold by Saboba in care exist dollars selling and distribution cost. Assist dollars selling and distribution cost. So what's going on here? Stay with me very carefully. Stay with me very carefully. So let's build our knowledge on the finished goods. So the story we have told here is on the raw material. Let's go to another story here about the finished goods. How should we value the finished goods? Let's see. We need to look at the selling price of the finished goods now. So in the finished goods, let's look at the manufacturing cost of the finished goods. So manufacturing cost of the finished goods. What do we have? Please stay with me very carefully. They said, the company, please give me a moment. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. So the finished goods uses 10 kilogram per unit. Now remember, we were told that 10 kilogram or a kilogram cost three Ghana cities. So material cost. Ooh, let's open this up a little bit. So material cost. That'll be 10 kilogram at three Ghana cities per kilogram. And so that's going to be 30. Then we are also told that the company incurs conversion cost. So the conversion cost the company incurs, in the question we are told they incur a cost of 25 Ghana cities. So in total, the manufacturing cost per unit of a tank will be 55 Ghana cities.
Okay, so this is the manufacturing cost per tank. So what is the net realizable value as well? Because the examiner gave us information about it. The examiner said, now, even though our price is 100 Ghana cities, then tank can now sell for just 90 Ghana cities. So let's get a net realizable value. So in the net realizable value part, we'll bring in our selling price. So the expected selling price, that is 90 Ghana cities. Please note that when you're dealing with net realizable value, don't use the original selling price. Use the prevailing selling price. Let me take that again. Anytime you are doing net realizable value, you don't use the original selling price. You use the prevailing selling price. That is the current selling price. That's what you use always. Always. Be mindful of that. Always. But when it comes to cost of inventory, that one you use the historical cost, not the current cost. If it is about inventory we use in the production of goods and services or inventory for resale. So don't get it twisted. Don't say, oh, Jira, why are we not using the 100 and we are using the 90? Because that is the current selling price. Okay, why is it that the cost here, we are not using the 210 and we are using the 3? because we have to use the historical cost for determining the cost of inventories. Okay, make sure you get a distinction very well. Please take the cost side again. Which cost side are you talking about here? Which cost side? We are saying that the manufacturing cost is our direct material costs, uh, let me disable, our material cost, which is, 10, Ghana, mm -hmm. 10 kilogram per kilogram. Did I say 10 kilogram per kilogram? 10 kilogram per tank times three Ghana cities per kilogram. That is given directly in the question. So we pick it up. Then our conversion cost is given at 25. So we add that up, it gives us 55. But we are valuing finished goods. So we have to value the finished goods at lower of cost and net realizable value. Now we have the cost. Let's get a net realizable value. And we are saying that when it comes to getting net realizable value, you have to use the prevailing selling price. So the prevailing selling price is 90. But in the question, we are told that the company will incur a selling cost of what? Six. So we less cost to sell. Six. So if you look at it, our net realizable value of the finished goods is going to be 84. So if you compare the two, which one is lower? The manufacturing cost. As such, we say that the finished goods will be valued at 55 being the manufacturing cost. Now, you don't have to write this English. I'm teaching you. That's why I'm writing it down. The finished goods should be valued at the manufacturing cost, because that is lower of 55. Why? Because that is lower. Because that is lower. So let's get a value of the finished goods. So the value of the finished goods is going to be, what was our unit of for finished goods? Um, 250 units. So we'll get 250 units. Multiply by 55 Ghana cities. So let's get the answer coming in. That is 13,750. That is the closing stock of finished goods. Just finished goods. We will come back and finish up with the raw material part. But this is the closing stock of finished goods. Remember, the examiner didn't say calculate closing stock of finished goods. The examiner says calculate the closing stock of the raw material. So they are together. Oh, sorry, of the inventory. So you have to bring in both finished goods 
and the raw material. But that is the closing stock of the finished goods, the lower of cost and net realizable value. Yes, Abigail, your hand is up. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, please. I want you to explain um why we didn't use the hundred CDs, but rather the eighty. You were explaining the but my network went through, so I couldn't um hear you well. What we mentioned was that um when it comes to determining the net realizable value, you use the prevailing selling price not the original selling price of the entity. You use the prevailing. What is the current selling price? Because net realizable value means if we should sell the thing right now, how much can we sell it for? So that is why we would have to use the prevailing selling price, in this case, 90, and not the original selling price, which was the 100. That's the rationale behind it. Okay, thank you. Right. So let's go back to the inventory and let's finish up with the raw material. Listen carefully. Please listen carefully. IAS 2 states that in determining the value of raw material, you have to consider three things. Three things. Number one, the cost of the raw material, number two, the net realizable value if we sell the raw material, and number three, the net realizable value if the raw material is converted into finished goods and sold. Oh. <laughs> so please follow me very well so that you don't get missing, okay? Because otherwise, you know, the average student who just finish with this one and go away, where do you go? Poto. So I'm saying that, when it comes to valuing, valuation of raw materials, usually we're going to consider three things. One, the historical cost of the raw material. Two, the net realizable value if the raw material is sold. And three, the net realizable value if the raw material is converted into finished goods and sold. That's it. So now we have the historical cost checked. We have the net realizable value if the inventory is sold, checked. But let's look at the net realizable value if the raw material is converted into finished goods. What will be the net realizable value? <laughs> oh my God. That is what makes the standard beautiful. So net realizable value of raw material if con if converted into finished goods and sold and sold so stay with me carefully now if we convert the raw material into finished goods what do we have you know already we have the selling price of finished goods already so selling price of finished goods, you know that already it's 90. No problem. We bring that up. Then we will less the conversion cost. That was given to us in the question as 25, if you remember. So you less it. Then the cost to sell, we less that also. And that was $6. If you remember, the cost to sell is $6. We less that also. So this becomes the net realizable value of finished goods when we convert the raw material. So 90 minus 25 minus 6. And that'll be 59 Ghana cities. So net realizable value per unit. But I want you to stay with me carefully. We are dealing with raw material. In the question, we are told that a tank uses 
10 kilograms of raw materials. So the question we then ask ourselves is, what is the net realizable value per kilogram of raw material? So net realizable value per kilogram of raw material. And that will be equal to 59 Ghana cities over 10 kilograms. Because remember, each unit of the tank uses 10 kilograms of raw material. So now the net realizable value per kilogram of raw material is going to be 5.9 Ghana cities. 5.9 Ghana cities. So now you have the three things. You have the net realizable value if the raw material is converted into finished goods, 5.9. You have the net realizable value if we sell the inventory right now, here and here, right now, and you have the net realizable value if we uh, look at the cost of the raw material. So the question we then ask ourselves in the context of this question is this. I'm seeing a chat coming in. Please. Why are we leasing conversion costs to the net? I think you're saying lessen conversion costs to net realizable value. Yeah, because the concept or the assumption we are making here is this, that we are converting the raw material into finished goods. So if you are converting the raw material into finished goods, what is the net realizable value? What is the net realizable value? That is the rationale here. That is where the conversion cost must be deducted because the conversion cost will be incurred in order for us to convert the raw material into the finished goods. In order for us to incur the raw, uh, convert the raw material into finished goods. Let me know if that makes sense. So now how do we value raw material? When we have a scenario like this, let me put the rule down for you, then sure, let's, then we go away. NB. To value raw material, okay, to value raw material, okay, to value raw material, use the lower of cost and the net realizable value when the raw material is converted or processed processed into finished goods. into finished goods. So in the context of this question, all we are saying here is that our net realizable value per kilogram is 5.9. Our original cost is 3.5. So when you compare the two, the 3.5 is the lower. So we value the closing inventory of raw material. at the manufacturing at the manufacturing cost of 3.5. So what will be our value then? Our raw material will be equal to 3.5 Ghana cities multiplied by the Raw materials, we have 950 kilograms. And that will give us an answer of 3.5 by 950. 3325 Ghana cities. So once you have this, we can then value 
the total closing stock, which is the answer to the question. All these things we are doing is just five marks. Some of you have already given up. Give up and leave the IC for us. Go and continue to give birth and have fun. We will do the IC. Give up. Plus the finished goods, which is 13750 and that gives us the value of the closing stock 3325 plus 13750 and that is 17 and 75 this is the answer to the question and that is how we value closing inventory when we have raw material and finished goods and that is saboba limited that is saboba limited any questions you raise your hand we bring you up or you put it in the chat for us. Okay, on YouTube, I'm seeing some chats coming in. What do we have? Um, Onuyame said, what? Uh, following from Kumasi. Okay. Uh, that's good there. And then Miriam said, you are the best. Thank you. Uh, Matthew said, good evening, Nishira. Good evening. Joe Owusu Efriye said, uh, thank you, Nishira, for the wonderful work. Always a pleasure. Matthew Abu Turi said, I need a Christmas gift from you in the form of discounts to enable me register for one paper for the December exams. One paper and you want the discounts. Come on, man. Told you we're doing like three papers, then I would have given you discounts right now. But one paper there, no, no, no. You won't get the discount for one paper. One paper there. I could have showered you some blessings, but one paper there, it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> Matthew. Uh, Taiwo said, uh, well done, sir, from Nigeria. Okay. Samuel Edwin said, leave ICU for us and go and have children. <laughs> yeah, if you give up, leave the ICU for us, go and have children. We like it. Some of you have already given up. Leave it for us. Yeah, like, geez, how can I finish this? Okay, so somebody said you want to take a screenshot. Is that Sally Fu? I think so. Yeah. Uh, am I supposed to start here for you? Or uh, because this is just a write-up. So if you I want you to take this. So let me let me write something up for you here because I want you to take this well. So let's put it this way. We will say that um finished goods should be valued at lower of course and neutralizable value, but the raw material should be valued at so, because I want you to get the rules well. So let's, we will value raw material as lower of cost and net realizable value if converted into finished goods. Sounds good? Into finished goods. So I want you to take that rule and establish it now. Sounds good? Now, if we don't have the... Uh, net realizable value if converted into finished goods if there is no way for us to calculate that then that is where the net realizable value if the inventory is sold will come in okay so i would want you to use this as the rule to establish it and then we get excited about it prince jay who said it's great okay Mohammed Lamin Kanu said, very comprehensive, sir. Okay, that's great to hear. I believe we're good now. Next page, raw material. Next page. Completing the raw materials and valuing it. Next page, finished goods. And then final page, closing inventory. Closing inventory. Um, Salifu, I believe you are good now with your Snapchat.
Okay. So that is accounting for inventory. IAS2. Now, the beauty of this is that the beauty of this is that um, you can have a dedicated question like this in the exam hall, or like Neil, Nile, whatever the heck, this question we solved in the exam hall, or it could be part of the footnotes for you to deal with it. Okay, it could be part of the footnotes for you to deal with it. Either way, that's how IAS2 is going to be dealt with generally. Now, there are other issues like, you know, uh, preparing of store ledger card, doing FIFO and LIFO and those things, but I'm technically not going to go into that. But anyone with some introduction in management accounting, you know about that very well, where you're going to be using FIFO method, weighted average method to prepare the store ledger card, those kind of things. Those things are management accounting. It's for management accounting students, technically. In the financial accounting class, we, we are interested in crunching numbers like what we have crunched in terms of, uh, I mean, Nile and then Saboba. Okay, so that is another part of inventory preparing the store ledger card and looking at the movement of inventory. That is more in management accounting, introductory issue to management accounting. So we're not going to be dealing with it uh, here in that case. Yes, Solomon, your hand is up. Yes, Solomon, your hand is up. Okay, sir. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Sure. Listen, in relation to the question we just solved mm -hmm. i am not getting the the value of um the closing um, value because i i i checked that with the finished Which closing group, value uh, i don't know can i see your solution again the yes. solution is on your the screen. 13 the 13 750 uh -huh. yes because you said that to get the value of the closing stock, we are going to look at the cost and then the uh, cost of conversion, right? No, the no, cost no. Of the plastic, relax, uh, plastic, relax, sorry. relax, relax. There are two types of inventories here. There are there is finished goods and raw material. We said in the finished goods valuation, we're going to use lower of cost and net realizable value. Okay. So when it comes to the finished goods here, the cost of finished goods is 55. The net realizable value of finished goods is 84. So which one is lower? 55. So yes. we value the 250 units at 55. Okay. So it's about what type of inventory are we dealing with? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. All right. Then uh, let's see, what else do I have? I'm seeing some comments also coming in. And if there are any other questions, you raise your hand and we bring you up for those of you on Zoom or put it in the chat for me. Gloria J, you are always a blessing. Why not using Gloria? Why are you not on the Zoom call? Or is it not a Gloria I know? Gloria, why are you on YouTube and not on the Zoom call? Anna, you like to be on YouTube. It's another person. Uh, is it? It's another Gloria, not Gloria in your class. Oh, okay. I'm on Zoom. Uh, yeah. oh, okay. I have another Gloria J also in level two though. So I that she and she's the one chatting on YouTube. So that's what I think that's what I, um um I think she's the one rather. As well, she's on. She's in level two. You are her senior, though. So she said, "Why not using the one point eight by three point five? We have established that that when we have the uh, way we can convert the raw material into finished goods, we wouldn't use the net realizable value if the inventory is sold. So that is why we are going with the three point five and not the one point eight, which is the net realizable value." if the inventory is sold right now. If we don't have an information on how we can calculate the 
net realizable value of inventory if converted into finished goods, then we would have used the net realizable value if the inventory is sold today, right now. So that is why we are not using the 1.8 in the context of this question, because the question is put in such a way that we could calculate the net realizable value if the raw material is converted into finished goods. That is why. Mohammed Lamin Kanu said, Sir, I need a clearer explanation concerning the valuation of goods meant for resale and also production. And lastly, those office use. Yes, goods, inventory meant for resale should be valued at lower, of course, and net realizable value. Inventory meant for office consumption should be valued at lower, of course, and replacement cost. Does that make sense? That is, that is the issue. So if the inventory is for resale or to be used in the production of it serving as an input for the production of goods and services, then it should be valued at lower of cost and net realizable value. But if it is an inventory item that will be used in the office, okay, so to be used by the entity in the office, not for resale, then it will be valued at lower of cost and replacement cost. That's the idea. That's the idea. That is why in this question, it's like the examiner tricked you to put the 2.1 there. And I said that 2.1 is the replacement cost. But because the plastics are used to manufacture tanks, we can't use replacement cost in its valuation. We must use the historical cost. That is why we didn't use the 2.1 and we still used the three Ghana cities. And we still use the three Ghana cities. So, Mohammed Lamin Kanu on YouTube, let me know if that is okay for you there in that case. Then, uh, another comment coming in. Jose Kledos said, Hi, hello, Kledos. Thanks for joining us on the stream uh, today as well. Let's go. So that is IAS2, inventories. Very sweet, simple, straight to the point. <laughs> All right. Let's look at another inventory. Hey, did I say another inventory? <laughs> another, you know. Now, those of you who are studying under my mentorship, you're enrolling in our online program, you can try your hands on, uh, oh, there should be another question here. Oh, there should be another question. Okay, maybe it's not in the slide here, but we will put another question up for you in the on the page. Then you can try your hands on it uh, because there's another question complex like that that I have on inventories and I'll bring it up for you to try your hands on it for those of you who are um, studying and enrolling our program. Mohammed Lamin said, thank you, sir. I'm okay now. All right, that's fine. So let's look at another standard for the evening. Uh, and that will be one of the simplest standards there. And that is IAS 8, Accounting Policies, Changes in Accounting Estimates and Errors. I want you to stay with me very carefully here. I want you to stay with me very carefully here because it is important for you to identify what an accounting policy is and how it is treated and what an accounting estimate is and how it is treated. So before I come to my slide, let, let's 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 share some stories. Let me tell you a love story. So let's share some love story. IAS 8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. Of the bed, I want you to understand two things from our story is accounting policies. And Accounting estimates. Let's let's start a story from there. So accounting policies on one side, accounting estimates on one side. Now, accounting policies in a simple language are the fundamental principles, assumptions, or if you want, conversions conventions, sorry, conventions used or adopted by an entity 
in the preparation and presentation of financial statements. Okay, used by management in the preparation and presentation of financial statements. So the basic principles, assumptions, conventions used by management in the preparation of financial statements can be referred to as accounting policies. Accounting policies. Then we have accounting estimates. The accounting estimates are just the professional judgments used by management in the preparation of financial statement, which are on items which doesn't have solid assumptions to be used. So let's give some examples quickly. For instance, method of depreciation. The economic useful life of an asset. Making of provisions. These are accounting estimates because they are based on the judgment of the organization. They are based on the judgment of management. So if we change the accounting for uh, uh, an asset, Instead of using the straight line method, we use the reducing balance method. So we change from the straight line method to the reducing balance method. That is called a change in accounting estimate. If the entity is using an asset and they said, oh, the economic useful life of the asset is 10 years. But later on, they change and say that now the economic useful life of the asset is 20 years. That is a change in accounting estimate. It is based on the professional judgment of the organization. It's based on the professional judgment of the organization. However, where an entity is capitalizing on expenses, but then they now decide to expense it in the account, then it is a change in accounting policy. So there is an expenses the entity in case. Previously, they capitalized it in accordance with probably IAS 38, intangible assets. But now they are writing it off in the profit or loss account. Then it's a change in accounting policy. Again, if an item, it's being included in say cost of sales, but for some reason, the entity now classify the item as part of say operating expenses, that can also amount to changing accounting policies. The question is, how do we do this and why will a company do this? Note that when it comes to accounting estimates, they are applied prospectively. So accounting estimates are applied prospectively. So application, they are applied prospectively. What does that mean? It means that the change affects current financial statements and future financial statements. The change affects only current financial statements. and future financial statements. But if there is a change in accounting policy, it 
it is retrospective application. Retrospective application. What does that mean? It means that when there is change in accounting estimates, the change affects current financial statements and previous financial statements. The change affects both current and previous financial statements. Why? It's because we want to enhance comparability of the financial statements, which is one of the key fundamental qualitative characteristics of, uh, which is one of the qualitative characteristics, not fundamental. It's an enhancing qualitative characteristics. So it's to enhance comparability of the financial statement, which is part of the uh, qualitative characteristics of the financial statement. That is the idea about the application. What does that mean? Because it may, when we say retrospective application, it means we are assuming that even though we are doing the change this year, it has been done previously. Now, how far back can we go? It depends on the judgment of the company. They can go one year back. They can go two years back or, you know, three years back. But note, the standard states that where it is impractical to apply it retrospectively, a change in accounting policy will be applied prospectively. Let me explain that. The standard says where it is impractical, meaning it doesn't make sense, meaning it is not possible for us to go back to the previous financial statement and adjust it, then the entity can use prospective application even though it is a change in accounting policy. Did you get that? So what we are saying is that, yes, a change in accounting policy should be applied to the previous financial statements. But the standard says where it is impractical to do that, you can apply it prospectively. And you are not wrong. You're still correct. You are not wrong. You are still correct. That is the idea about accounting policies and estimates. If there are any questions, you raise your hand, we bring you up, or you put it in the chat for us. Yes, James, your hand is up. A little, please, can you take it over when it is impracticable? So the standard says that where it is impractical to apply the change in accounting policy prospectively, it should be applied retrospectively. Hey, sorry, let me take that again. If it is impractical to account for the change in accounting policy retrospectively, then it should be applied prospectively. Meaning, even though we are supposed to apply it retrospectively, we are supposed to adjust the previous year financial statement. If it is impractical to do that, it is unreasonable to do that. It will be time wasting to do that. It will not really change the financial statement. Then we should apply it prospectively, meaning to the current financial statement and future financial statements. That's what we're saying here. Thank but then you. the question, okay. But then the question we ask ourselves is, why should an entity change the policy? Why is it that, for instance, something we are capitalizing, now we are expensing it. Something that we were treating in cost of sales, now we are treating it in operating expenses. Why? Usually there are two or three reasons for the change. So let me go into my slide now and then share some thoughts briefly with you in this particular case. So accounting policies. 
We just want to dive deeper and provide you with some other issues generally in that particular case. So these are the basic principles, policies, conventions, uh, rules and practices applied in the preparation of financial statements. Okay, now the following are some examples of accounting policies. So valuation of inventory. That's an accounting policy. So you can value inventories using either the FIFO method or the simple average method or any other suitable method as per the IAS2. Remember, LIFO is forbidden. LIFO is no longer, it's not acceptable in line with IAS2. So FIFO, uh, the simple average method or sometimes the weighted average method. Classification, anything that has to do with classification, presentation and measurement can also be referred to as what? A change in accounting policy. That was what I told you here, that sometimes an entity is capitalizing on expenses. Then now they said they want to write it off in the PNL account. That would change the way they classify the item. Timing of recognition of assets, liabilities, expenses, and income can be also a change in accounting policies. The basis of measurement, you know, if you remember, we spoke about basis of measurement. For those of you in the main class, we said we can either use fair value, uh, replacement cost, net realizable value, value in use. Those are also accounting policies. Okay, so if inventories, oh, sorry, if assets are being carried at a historical cost, then for some reason, the entity says they are now carrying the assets at another uh, basis that they are changing, then it has to be applied retrospectively so that we will be able to compare the financial statement. Then certainly a cruel basis of preparing financial statement is also an accounting basis generally in that regard. Now, when is it appropriate for us to change accounting policies? Two reasons technically. One, it is required by a new standard or a new interpretation. So if there is a new accounting standard that provides guidelines on how something is supposed to be treated and entities are mandated to adopt the standards, the standard, then it's a change. We have to change it. Or sometimes it is not a new standard that a account, international accounting standard board will, will issue. It could be an interpretation that will be brought. Now, interpretations are meant to provide more clarity on how items are supposed to be treated in the financial statements. That is the first mandatory manner in which we can change a policy. The second thing is, if in management's judgment, they feel that the change will provide more reliable and relevant information to the users, then they will change it. So that is why they could be putting something in cost of sales but now they want to put it in operating expenses. Why? Because they feel that it will provide a better understanding. Because if something is in cost of sales, gross profit is going to be affected. But if the thing doesn't fit cost of sales, then we will rather reflect gross profit in its true nature. So if management feels that the change will provide a more reliable and relevant information to the users, then they can change it then they can change it. That is what we are trying to say here in that particular case. So that is the issue about that. Then finally will be the issue in relation to prior period adjustments. Prior period adjustments. Now, prior periods are omissions from and misstatements in an entity's financial statement for one or more period arising from a failure to use or misuse reliable information, which is identified later on. It is called prior period adjustment. So for instance, if let's say for we have an item, then the entity realizes that, oh, we are in 2016. But then last year, 2015, there was an omission of a revenue figure for say $10,000, that is prior period error. So what do we do? Now, if revenue was omitted, what is the implication of that? 
That means profit reduced by 10,000. So in the year 2016, we will go to the retained earnings and add this 10,000 revenue omission to it. Because revenue, when it is omitted, reduced our profit by 10,000. So in the retained earnings brought forward, we will add backwards the 10,000 to it. If it is an expenses also, then we will less it from the retained earnings. I hope you are getting the idea. That is what we mean by prior error er errors. So you are in 20X6, but there is a transaction that relates to 20X5. So now bring it up. So when you are bringing it up in the current year, usually that change will occur in the retained earnings. It will not occur in the current year statement of profit or loss. Instead, it will occur in the retained earnings. And if its impact affects any item on the face of the statement of financial position, then you adjust it. So let's say this revenue that was omitted was actually credit sales. If it was credit sales, then it means for this whole transaction, two things happened. Profit was understated and trade receivables was also understated. So if we are correcting it now, the profit that has been understated, that is what we will be adding back to the retained earnings. Then the trade receivable that has been understated, when we go to the statement of financial position, we will add it to the trade receivable figure that is on the face of the statement of financial position. That is the idea about prior period errors. Nanaki has said, sir, please, when such error is corrected, does it appear in the notes to the account? Yes, we would have to make disclosure requirements about them that, okay, uh, an error of this uh, was committed in the last year financial statement. And so we uh, br bring it up in the current year financial statement and adjusted it. Usually, prior period errors will be applied retrospectively, meaning we will actually go back to the last year financial statement and restate it. That is why the opening retained earnings would have to be adjusted and the opening trade receivables will be adjusted. So prior period errors are applied retrospectively and disclosure requirements would have to be made explaining what the error is and the adjustments that were made in the accounts. So yes, we disclose it and bring it in the notes. Okay. Um, Abu said, though late, it feels great to join in. All right, Abu, welcome. Samuel said, in a case of retrospective application, what happens to the already published financial reports? Yes, it, if it is really material issue, the financial report will be redrawn and the recorrected amount to be published again at the end of the day. So they will have to redraw the previous one and republish the new one because if it is error and we have to correct it, then you do the right thing. So we redraw the previous one because it is misstated, then the right one will be uh, published usually to enhance management in making decisions. In other cases, what the entity would do is to uh, also release or they will make a press release, then that error will be noted in detail in the current financial statement. So they don't have to go back and republish the previous financial statement, but they would have to communicate that to the users. So when they are making the decision, they know what to make. Emmanuel said, please, Emmanuel Quino, are you not supposed to also be on Zoom? I don't know. Please, what if we overcharge depreciation in the previous year? Yeah, that is also prior period error. Depreciation is an expense. So if we overcharge depreciation, what's the implication on that? Let's analyze that. Overcharge of depreciation, let's analyze that. If the entity overcharge depreciation, two things are happening. It means profit has been understated. All right. Profit has been understated and um, assets, non-current assets has also been understated. 
right? Property, plant, and equipment is also understated due to the overcharge. So to correct this error, the excess depreciation will be added back to the retained earnings, opening balance, retained earnings. Then opening balance of PPE, we go and add also the excess depreciation to it because it's an expenses. So it's reduced the profit and reduced the assets as well. So we're going to add it back to make it reflect what it has to reflect. So that is also IAS 8 technically, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates, and errors, and errors. So what is going to be happening here is that usually, sorry, the examiner may give a note to it in the financial statement, and we would have to then structure ourselves up on how we can do the retrospective application or prospective application, depending on where exactly we are standing at. And that's the concept about IAS 8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates, and errors. Any questions for me, please? Any questions? Um, any questions? I'm going to be concluding around here uh, today uh, for our discussion. So fundamentally, paying attention to IAS2 inventories and uh, IAS8 accounting policies and accounting estimates, especially in the IAS2, the questions that we solved about the inventories, please be mindful of it very well as you try to go over some of these things. And uh, we will see if in the course of the week, possibly Monday, I wanted to do a session tomorrow, but um, I need to rest a little, so I would I would sleep a little tomorrow. So um, in the course of the week, Monday possibly I'll be coming your way, and then we can go to IAS ten events after the reporting period and solve some question around IAS eight, because around IAS eight we have some questions that we can look at. Uh, accounting that's right on page two here. Yeah. There's a question here in our question kit that we can solve in relation to IAS uh, 8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. So we will look at uh, one or two of these questions, God willing, on Monday and see how really the rules apply when it comes to practically applying the standard. Then we'll go to IAS 10 events after the reporting period then. We're going to be building it up as we go ahead. So that's it about that. And uh, au revoir. Go ahead and sleep and chill. We will Have see you. Have a good night. May I go to sleep? Sounds sleep. Go ahead and sleep. sleep. You, why would you go ahead and sleep? I will sleep. <laughs> sleep. Everybody will sleep. Good night. Good night. There is this proverb in Ghana, I can't remember. Oh, it's like you sukra jai him in tree, but it, there is a way they say it in Ghana. I love it a lot, but I can't remember. Careful. Careful, careful. Please don't try, don't try. No, 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 no. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. All right, sir. Yeah, yes. Yes. The, um, the first question we solve on the inventory. I, I wanted to take a screenshot of the solutions, please. Uh, I went off. Yes. Okay, so let me see if I can bring back my screen. One boy. 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 Cock boy, I see a yeah. Mini Bafi. I see a baby be only. Oya for be, oya for be. Okay, so Kofi, let me see if I can bring the In question. Uh, hey, yo. You are Maka Sydney. Yo. What are you doing? Um, Kofi, this is the question.
Oke. Okay. Yeah. Um, Emmanuel said, please hope it will be on the portal. I join it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll put it on the portal. And it's also available on YouTube. We will not remove it from YouTube as well. So I will also post it on the portal. So you can watch the playback. And also, Kofi, you good? Yes, I'm good, sir. All right. Okay, so chill out. Have a great Sunday. And uh, I'll catch you in the course of the week. Bye-bye. Sure, I hope for you go to church. Yeah, definitely, you know. Bye. We'll yeah, pray for you. you. <laughs> church, you don't know. Pray for <laughs> us, okay? <laughs> ah, you won't go to church. We'll pray for you for more strength. <laughs> you, no, why, you won't go to church? No, no, no. I'll stay at home and learn. So when you go, oh, pray for oh, oh, hey, 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 you. But, but this one, this one, <laughs> yeah, no. No, no, no. You go. For, go for more grace. I've collapsed. Hey, we'll pray for you. No, you collapse. The the exam, the exam has not reached there. Why are you serious <laughs> like that? Take it easy now. Abba. Hmm. Fine. The standard fast. If you don't start it, you don't finish it. You know the better. Hmm. Oh, but it's two hours. Oh, your your church is not two hours. Oh, less than two hours. Hey, so go ahead. Hmm. Hmm. Obonsam, oh. Obonsam B. <laughs> All right. So that's it.